so for inviting us to uh, give a talk here. So um, what we're going to do is to present Raxam LMG, uh, which is like basically a redesign of good old RaxML that is used for phylogenetic tree reconstruction under maximum likelihood. Um, Danny already said, so we're going to give this talk together, Alexei and me. So um, here's the outline of the talk. I will first give you an introduction to phylogenetic inference. And um, then I will present the basic RaxML search algorithm. Uh, that is also implemented in RaxML and G. And then I will uh, hand over to Alexei, who's kind of the mastermind behind this uh, totally redesigned version of RaxML. And uh, he'll talk about the uh, specific improvements we've applied in RaxML and G, and also give you a short uh, tutorial. Okay, so let's first start with an introduction to phylogenetic inference. Um, so, which is going to be very, this is a phylogeny. So as you can see here, this is an unrooted binary tree, typically. And um, a phylogeny describes the evolutionary relationships among different species, which are typically located at the tips of such a phylogeny, of such an uh, unrooted binary tree. And the inner nodes typically represent hypothetical common ancestors. Um, so, the stuff or the species that are located at the tips are also called extant species. So uh, mainly species uh, that are living today and whose DNA we can actually sequence. But of course, you could also do like some sort of ancient DNA sequencing to uh, include some older species. So typically that are located at the tip. Um, one very important thing uh, to keep in mind is that phylogenetic trees are typically uh, unrooted binary trees. So um, we don't, this is a binary tree, but without a root. Okay, so now if we look at the tree inference pipeline, how we typically go about a tree inference, um, this works as follows. So initially we have our set of species we're interested in studying. Uh, and a bunch of unaligned DNA sequences or protein sequences representing those species. And then we put them into a multiple sequence alignment program. We obtain a multiple sequence alignment. And on that multiple sequence alignment, we apply a tree inference program to infer a phylogenetic tree. And so this will be the focus of our talk today. How do we get from a multiple sequence alignment using RaxML and G? to an unrooted binary tree topology. Okay, so to start with, uh, if we look at this simple example with four species or four taxa, the main question is, well, how many unrooted uh, four taxon trees do actually exist? So uh, this is easy to figure out. So you just uh, consider the different um, ways in which you can assign uh, the species A, B, C, D to the leaves of such a four species tree, and you uh, find out that, well, it, uh, there are three possible tree topologies with four species. And then, of course, uh, once you've uh, figured out that, the key question is, well, how do we select among those uh, three possible alternative tree topologies? And quite evidently, in order to do that, we uh, need to have some scoring criteria that we can apply to the trees and the associated alignment data. So assume that we have a scoring criterion, we can calculate different scores for those three alternative tree topologies. And um, for instance, the most widely used criterion is maximum likelihood, or also just likelihood if we uh, do Bayesian phylogenetic tree analysis. And so uh, what we ask is, well, how likely is it that the tree given the specific tree given a model of evolution generated the observed data. And so if we want to maximize the likelihood and we just assume that uh, this is our likelihood score, then we would say that this tree topology over here is the most uh, likely tree. So this appears to be fairly simple, uh, but what happens uh, when I try to analyze 
trees with a larger number of taxa, so, or species. Um, so if for three taxa, there's only one possible unrooted tree topology, and then I can start constructing all trees that contain four taxa by just adding um, a new species attached to this yellow branch here into all branches of the tree or all possible trees of size three. So thereby I already get three alternative tree topologies. Then if I repeat the same procedure, so I take all uh, possible trees for four species and then add a new species that is attached to this new yellow branch, I already get 15 alternative tree topologies. And so I can continue doing that for six species. There are 105 uh, possible tree topologies. And so what actually happens is that, well, uh, if I continue doing that, I will quickly see that the number of possible tree topologies explodes. Um, so just to show you how large the number of possible tree topologies really is. Um, so this is the exact number of possible trees containing 2,000 species. And as you can see, this is a pretty large number. So this is uh, three times 10 to the power of uh, 6,300 and something. So we're dealing with like a, an extremely large uh, search space here. Okay, um, so this means be that because the search space is so large, large, we uh, have like a huge problem complexity because we want to find this kind of, or we're striving uh, to find this global maximum that is located here at the top of our huge, enormous tree space. So down here are the bad scores, the bad trees, and up here are the good scores, the ones with the good maximum likelihood score, for instance. And so what we need to come up with is some sort of heuristic uh, tree search strategy that gets us as close as possible to this global maximum. Um, so unfortunately, uh, finding, it has been shown, it has been formally shown that finding the best tree under maximum likelihood is NP hard. So uh, designing good heuristic strategies or uh, appropriate approximation algorithms maybe is the only solution in um, dealing to deal with this uh, tree search uh, problem, so with this vastness of the tree uh, space. Okay. And of course, what you should keep in mind, as this is in P hard, and in practice, all programs I know uh, typically use heuristic tree search strategies, those maximum likelihood based tree searches can end up in a local optima. Okay, so uh, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to very quickly um, introduce some components of the maximum likelihood model or like phylogenetic likelihood model in general that are uh, important for optimizing the performance of those codes. So um, as I said before, as an input, we're given a multiple sequence alignment with a couple of sequences that has length M. And then of course, uh, we need to have a statistical model of evolution. So this is our substitution model here that somehow describes the uh, transitions between the different states here shown for DNA data. And here's like a more detailed view of those like of a typical nucleotide substitution model. So you have some rate of staying in, uh, in the current state, but then also some additional rate of um, going from state A to state C to state T or to state G. And so typically, uh, I'll spare you more details, but typically we model evolution, so the evolution of DNA sequences as a time reversible Markov process. Okay, and so this model is commonly denoted as a Q matrix uh, that gives us the uh, transition probabilities for, for time dt, and then to calculate the transition probabilities for real time t, we need to calculate the uh, matrix exponential of this Q matrix. Then evidently, since we're dealing with Markov models, so we also need the prior probabilities or stationary frequencies. Um, 
of being in state A, C, D, or T. All right, and so if we're given the alignment and if we're given the uh, substitution model and the stationary frequencies, we can start thinking about, well, how do we actually calculate the likelihood on such a trip? So um, what matters for uh, likelihood-based models is not only the tree topology as such, so that like sequence one is located next to sequence two and sequence three is located next to sequence four, but also the branch lengths here. So this is something to keep in mind. And um, in order to be able to calculate the likelihood score on a phylogenetic tree, the first thing we need to do is to throw a virtual root onto the phylogeny such that we um, can have or are given a, a traversal direction or traversal path for that tree. And the really cool thing about uh, the fact that we're using time reversible Markov models uh, is actually <clears throat> that it doesn't matter onto which branch we actually throw that virtual root, um, we can throw it onto any branch and also um, on at any position along that branch and we'll always get the same likelihood score. So this is the, um, uh, well, the good thing about the process being time reversible that we can just place a virtual root anywhere on the tree. Um, so assume that we have decided to place our virtual root on this branch, branch five, what we then do is that we conduct a post-order traversal of the tree and start uh, computing um, some sort of uh, what we call conditional likelihood vectors that are shown here for this inner node and here for this inner node. Uh, and those conditional likelihood vectors uh, essentially summarize the signal coming from this part of the tree, so from sequence one and sequence two given the two branch lengths, and this vector here, this conditional likelihood vector here, summarizes the signal coming from this part of the tree. And those conditional likelihood vectors do have the same number of entries as we have sites in our alignment, only that per alignment column, we store the probability conditional on the sequences in the subtree of observing an A, C, G, or T at the specific position um, of the conditional likelihood vector, right? So the correspondence can be seen here. So sequence one and sequence two are uh, located in the subtree and we're considering the data for the first alignment column here. And this gives us the conditional probabilities of observing A, C, G, or T at this inner node here. So what is the reason that I'm showing this to you? Um, so the, the computation and the storage of those conditional likelihood vectors is what really dominates the runtime requirements as well as the memory requirements of uh, all sorts of uh, phylogenetic likelihood calculations. So this applies to maximum likelihood based methods, but also to Bayesian inference methods. Um, this is, of course, uh, this operation both like calculating um, the values in those conditional likelihood vectors, as well as storing those conditional likelihood vectors in a very large tree with many leaves, are uh, really challenging. Okay, another nice thing or observation uh, to make uh, here is that sites, our model assumes that sites of the alignment evolve independently. Um, as a consequence, this means that we can compute the per sites, the per site likelihoods in parallel. So if we have an alignment with 1,000 sites um, uh, and we have 1,000 processors, we could, in principle, just assign one alignment site to each processor, um, have, uh, have each processor compute the per site likelihood score, then only in the end, those processors would need to communicate to compute the overall likelihood score for the entire alignment. Okay. So um, this is the end of the short introduction to phylogenetic inference. And now I'm going to talk uh, briefly about the uh, RaxML search algorithm. So this is a, um, the old version, the old search algorithm implemented in the old version of RaxML that has also made it with some slight modifications to uh, the new version of RaxML, RaxMLMG. Okay, so how does it work? 
Initially, what we do is that typically we compute a randomized uh, stepwise addition order maximum parsimony tree. So this sounds very complicated. Um, so parsimony is just like a simpler discrete criterion that uh, can be used to score trees and is therefore much faster to compute. And then the only other thing that matters really here is um, this kind of uh, randomization part here. So uh, this means that we can, using a simpler criterion, we can get like a meaningful tree or not like a non-random tree to start our maximum likelihood search. And we can randomize this procedure in such a way that we can generate several topologically distinct starting trees. Um, so in this, we always consider this as being an advantage of RxML that the search actually starts or can start from distinct points in the search space every time. Um, and well, I should also mention that of course, instead of using a randomized stepwise addition order parsimony tree, we can also start from like a completely random tree. This is also an option uh, if you're worried that maybe using parsimony might bias the search in one or the other way. Okay, so the idea of using multiple starting trees is illustrated on this slide here. So if you have a good starting tree, you're starting up here in our vast search space and you can hopefully move closer to this desired global maximum in the search space. And then if you have another good starting tree, uh, you might be able to even move closer to this global maximum. So you're kind of better exploring the search space. Right, and so after we've computed this uh, randomized stepwise addition order maximum parsimony tree, what we do is that we apply so-called lazy subtree rearrangements um, to the starting tree and essentially keep applying those changes to the tree topology, including a check, of course, if the likelihood improves for as long as we can improve the maximum likelihood score of the tree. And if we cannot find like an additional move or change that we can apply uh, to the phylogeny um, to our current tree that would further improve the maximum likelihood score, we just stop. So here are some details about how this works. So this is a technique that is called subtree pruning and regrafting. So um, here, uh, what you see is a phylogeny with a couple of subtrees shown by those triangles here. And the subtree we want to try and prune from its current position. So we're pruning it here and then we attempt, we're regrafting it or reinserting it into neighboring branches of the current tree topology and of course reevaluate the likelihood score of that tree. So we can do that at a distance of one node away from the original position of that subtree like this. And of course, we can also do that at a position of two nodes away from uh, the original pruning position that was located in the center, at the center of this branch here, um, and so on and so forth. Right. And so this kind of uh, search parameter, uh, which of course determines or has an impact on the quality or thoroughness of the search, can be explicitly set in RaxML and G via this SPR radius command. Okay. And um, another thing to know is that if you don't explicitly set um, this a search parameter like this, uh, like regrafting radius in RaxML and G, it will just be auto-tuned by the program. Okay, so in principle, what happens if I want to compute the maximum likelihood score of such a regrafting? So in principle, what I would need to do would be to re-optimize all branches in the tree uh, indicated by dotted lines here and by this little um, arrow here for an inter iterative numerical optimization. So I would need to optimize all branches in the tree to compute the maximum likelihood score of the new tree. But the question is, of course, this is kind of very time consuming. So do we really need to optimize all branches or can we maybe compute some sort of approximate maximum likelihood score uh, or approximate likelihood score for inserting subtree 6 And so uh, this is a technique that we call lazy subtree pruning and regrafting. So if once again, we prune our subtree number six from its original position and then uh, reinsert it here into this branch, 
Well, if we do a so-called fast subtree pruning and regrafting round, we're not really optimizing any branches at all. So we're just inserting it into the middle of this branch and recalculating the likelihood to get like uh, an initial approximation whether this tree topology could be better than the original one. And then we also have a so-called slow SPR move or slow SPR round where we simply optimize the three branches that are adjacent to the insertion position. Right, and so those are the two kind of basic moves that uh, we use in uh, RAXML and RAXMLNG um, to conduct tree searches. And with that, I can now hand over to Alexei, who will talk to you about the improvements uh, that we've applied in RAXML uh, next generation. So Alexei, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Alexis, <clears throat> for a general introduction. I will share my screen. Just a second. Oops. What happened? Okay, somehow it doesn't work and I will try it again. Because it might be because I'm not in a full screen mode in Zoom. Uh, that may be having okay. an impact. Yep, try that. Yeah, so now I'm in full screen mode. And Uh, it looks like the options is grayed out for you. You may have to close and reopen the slides. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sorry for this technical problem. We just tested it beforehand <laughs> and it worked. Okay, now you should see my slides. There we go, we're good. Yeah. Right. Okay, uh, sorry again for this technical uh, problem. So, and thanks again to Alexis for his uh, general <coughs> introduction. Now I can jump uh, right to the uh, new and exciting uh, stuff we have in RaxMLNG. But uh, first I would like to give a, a bit of uh, historical context because uh, we often get uh, questions. Okay, there's now this new RaxMLNG, how does it relate to old RaxML and also to XML? And uh, that's why I um, created this uh, slide. So uh, in fact, um, old RaxML, it's a main um, uh, file genetic inference code, which uh, evolved uh, over many, many years. And it also accumulated uh, enormous amount of features, some of them uh, also experimental or uh, originally meant for internal use. And uh, then at some point we uh, branched a new code called XML. And uh, this code was uh, specifically optimized for large supermatrices. Uh, and it included um, features like checkpointing or advanced load balancing algorithm, which were uh, important 
for um, uh, large computing clusters. But at the same time, in uh, XML, we had pretty much uh, bare bones uh, research. So it couldn't do a bootstrapping. Uh, bootstrapping. It couldn't even uh, infer starting trees. So this uh, <coughs> randomize uh, other uh, parsimony uh, starting trees. So you had to do all this additional processing with uh, standard XML and then use uh, XML for tree search. And of course, it was not really convenient for the users. It was also not uh, optimal for us to maintain uh, two codes in parallel. So um, therefore, now with RaxMLNG, we have again a single code, which um, offers uh, all functionality of all RaxML and XML, which we uh, consider important. And uh, this tool uh, now is the successor of both. So as of uh, 2020, we actually do not support all DraxML and all uh, XML, uh, XML anymore, uh, and uh, really encourage uh, everyone to uh, switch to RaxMLNG. And as you can see, it uh, already went quite a long way. So first release was 2017, and uh, during those three years, we uh, fixed quite, quite a lot of bugs. So I'm really grateful to all early adopters who uh, tested uh, early versions and reported uh, uh, all the bugs on RaxML Google Group and on GitHub. So now it's uh, version 1.0 and um, I consider it to be uh, quite stable. Right, so uh, what were our goals with RaxMLNG? So uh, as uh, Alexis uh, already mentioned, we uh, just rewrote uh, all code from scratch without changing the core um, search heuristic. So the uh, main um, objective here was just to make the old code uh, easier to maintain and to extend, which was uh, uh, quite a huge issue and uh, also like from personal perspective I can say that when I started to work on RaxMLNG I was already two or three years uh, in my PhD and uh, during those years I was working with uh, old RaxML as a developer by uh, when I had to adapt it to uh, for my project but also as a user I just I uh, was analyzing some empirical data set. And then additionally, I was also uh, providing support for um, external RaxML users on the Google group. So I had a bit of idea what was problematic with all RaxML, what was annoying for me personally, which features I was missing and so on. And I tried to um, use this knowledge to uh, improve uh, situation in uh, RaxMLNG. So one uh, a particular point which I uh, uh, try to uh, realize is uh, just improve uh, user experience. And uh, I, I will give uh, several uh, specific examples later in my talk, but in general, the uh, philosophy, so to say, is now that uh, I try to uh, do the right thing by default. So if a user is unaware which settings to choose and doesn't uh, specify anything in particular, then uh, RaxMLNG will try to do what is the best um, uh, best solution in, in most cases. Right, uh, this is a bit of internal view. So as uh, I said, uh, our major goal was to improve maintainability. So on the left, you can see the RaxML, old RaxML, it was a huge monolith with uh, more than 70,000 uh, code uh, lines of uh, C code. And uh, now we uh, encapsulated pretty much everything which could be reused uh, in a, a library called libpll. So this is, first of all, it's uh, uh, low level stuff like likelihood computation uh, but also uh, generic routines like uh, reading alignments, reading tree files, and so on. And then uh, RaxMLNG is uh, using this uh, library 
but uh, also other tools developed in our lab are now using this uh, uh, core functionality in the library. And uh, in particular, uh, AppNG, so this is an evolutionary replacement algorithm, which used to be a part of the old RuxML. Uh, now it's a, a separate tool uh, developed by uh, Pierre Bamber Bamber in our lab. Right, so this uh, definitely helped a lot with uh, maintainability, but uh, we uh, also uh, introduced some improvements. Um, so a lot of them were just um, removing the uh, limitation which were present in the old version. So just one specific example is that in uh, standard RuxML, uh, you are pretty much limited to um, a GTR uh, model for uh, DNA data, although in the latest version you could also specify minus minus uh, JC for UX counter, but then it was applying to uh, all partitions, so it was quite flexible. In RuxMLNG you can use all the classical model like uh, UX counter, HKY, uh, HKY and uh, all the rest, and you also can specify custom models by um, defining uh, symmetries in the um, substitution matrix. You can also use um, uh, fixed substitution rates in uh, <coughs> by ML format. And um, yeah, there is also much more flexibility with rate, rate heterogeneity. You could now specify it uh, individually for each partition. And uh, we implemented free rate model. You can use all kinds of uh, Branch lengths, uh, a linkage for uh, partition uh, alignments, and uh, a couple of uh, other um, improvements in flexibility. Then, uh, in terms of new uh, feature, we have uh, support for phylogenetic terrace detection. This is um, uh, relevant for uh, analysis with unlinked branch lengths. Uh, we also support um, a novel uh, transfer bootstrap. A metric, which is kind of extension or uh, alternative for a classical uh, <coughs> Fredenstein bootstrap for uh, large data sets. And then also recently I added um, some uh, energy monitoring features. Um, then uh, also there were a lot of changes, improvements in uh, performance and scalability. So first of all, as I mentioned, uh, RxMLNG now um, implements everything that XML uh, used to uh, offer, uh, namely checkpointing. So you can, uh, it's especially important in cluster environment where you usually have uh, job runtime limits, let's say 24 hours and your job got killed. And uh, with RuxMLNG, you can just resubmit your job and it will be resumed uh, from, uh, from the point where it was um, uh, interrupted. Then uh, we also have this uh, advanced load balancing, which uh, is uh, again important if you use uh, multiple nodes as uh, a lot of course. Uh, it supports binary alignment format, uh, which uh, allows to um, avoid sequential uh, overhead for uh, when uh, reading large, uh, large alignment files. Uh, then uh, also we have a so-called site reviews optimization. So that's a, a neat trick, which is uh, actually an extension of a, a old idea uh, of um, pattern compression. So if you uh, don't know, it's uh, if, if you have a um, large alignment, then uh, oftentimes in this alignment, we have columns which are completely identical and uh, likelihood of uh, each of those columns uh, will also uh, be identical. That's why we do not uh, need to compute it again and again, but we can just compute it once and multiply with the number of identical columns we have. So with site repeats, we can uh, uh, push this approach a bit further and we look for uh, partials, uh, partially identical columns. So if a um, certain subtree has uh, uh, identical um, sequences, um, then uh, 
we can also skip the computation. And uh, this uh, trick allows for uh, up to 60% uh, computational saving and also uh, allows to reduce memory requirements. And also uh, I uh, put uh, quite a lot of effort into making um, parallelization in RAXMLG as flexible and as user-friendly as possible. And uh, this uh, topic is uh, quite important and also quite complex. So that's why I will give you a bit more uh, details on this. If we uh, look at the hardware level, then in modern system, we have uh, multiple levels of parallelism. And it starts with uh, um, parallel uh, uh, instructions in the CPU. So you've probably heard uh, terms like AVX. Then it goes on with multiple cores, which is uh, now uh, pretty common. Uh, even laptop, you have at least two or four cores. And then in large system, you also want to utilize multiple nodes and uh, in uh, scientific calls, we typically use MPI interfaces. And in old RaxML, we actually uh, did have uh, support for all this uh, parallelization levels, but it was a, a kind of one-to-one -one projection and uh, user had to explicitly pick uh, for every uh, kind of parallelization, user had to use um, the corresponding um, binary. And uh, it was um, probably good for educating the users, but unfortunately, uh, I observed that uh, users constantly uh, got it wrong. And uh, oftentimes, they were reporting some problems on the Google group, some unrelated problem, but that I noticed, okay, but you're actually using the, this uh, RaxML HPC version, which is not vectorized and not parallelized. So it's actually, uh, your analysis is running much slower than it could. And that's why in uh, RaxMLNG, uh, we um, radically simplified it. So you uh, will have, most of the time you will have just one executable. If, you, if it's your laptop or individual server, then it's RaxMLNG, which will automatically uh, choose appropriate um, vectorization. And uh, it also supports uh, multi-training for utilizing multiple cores. And then in cluster environment, it's RaxMLNG MPI, which uh, also supports parallelization across multiple nodes, but of course, uh, to uh, underlying levels as well. And uh, another question is, of course, how do we use all those cores uh, that we have? And here, um, Alexis already mentioned it's a fine grade parallelization approach. So the most straightforward thing that we can do is uh, we can simply split uh, alignment columns uh, across um, CPUs or across threads, and then uh, each thread will um, process uh, its own uh, portion of alignment. And this uh, works pretty well because um, uh, alignment uh, columns, uh, our model, uh, uh, considers alignment uh, columns independent. But uh, if you have a short alignment of, let's say, 1,000 uh, columns, then uh, you cannot utilize a lot of cores because um, uh, uh, <coughs> synchronization overhead will become uh, uh, more, more critical. And uh, therefore, there is uh, so-called cause grant alignment where uh, use a different approach. We, we can say, okay, if we have multiple starting trees, which is uh, often the case in uh, real world analysis, then we could just assign uh, each uh, thread to a specific starting tree or specific search. And then uh, each thread will uh, process the whole alignment, but for specific um, starting trees. The starting tree. And then uh, it's uh, even easier to parallelize in the sense that those three searches are completely independent. So we don't really need to synchronize except in the very end where we um, compare the final likelihoods and pick the uh, best scoring tree. And uh, then of course, 
uh, we can also mix those two approaches and say, okay, if you have four starting trees and four uh, uh, threads, then uh, we can uh, assign uh, two threads to each uh, starting tree. And then once they are done, we can assess uh, third and fourth starting tree uh, sp splitting uh, across the threads again. Uh, right, and uh, uh, this was also actually available in the old TraxML or in XML, but uh, it was quite tricky to use. So now starting in uh, uh, version 1.0 of RaxMLNG, it's uh, uh, available uh, as well, and uh, it will uh, even be automatically configured for you. So I will explain it in uh, detail in the uh, um, uh, tutorial section. But uh, actually, uh, most of the time you will not, uh, you don't, you don't have to care about it at all. Right. So uh, now uh, I will uh, give a tutorial. So it will be like a mini tutorial because uh, we don't have uh, a lot of time. But uh, the full tutorial is available on the GitHub, so you can just uh, check it out there. Uh, so I will start with the uh, simplest possible command line for XMLNG. Uh, if, uh, if you specify multiple sequence alignment and uh, evolutionary model, then RaxMLNG will uh, perform a, a tree search with default parameters. And uh, it will start, uh, it will use uh, 20 uh, distinct starting trees. And uh, in the end, it will uh, compare the likelihood and pick a, a topology which uh, yields the best score. And uh, the reason we use uh, uh, 20 is, uh, as uh, Alexis mentioned, there is uh, always a risk that uh, <clears throat> one uh, individual tree search will uh, become stuck in the um, local optimum. So we want to um, exclude this possibility or at least minimize it by using multiple starting points. So this is a, uh, 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 typical output. So you, you will see uh, uh, progress of the tree search with um, timestamps and uh, best likelihood so far. And then in the end, you, you will see the final likelihood of the best scoring tree and the best scoring tree with all those will be also saved, saved to a file in a new form. You can uh, also reduce the uh, uh, verbosity of the, of, of the lock if you want. Right, then uh, uh, typically uh, we also uh, want to have some uh, confidence value on the three branches. And for that you can use a, a minus minus all uh, option which performs uh, so-called all-in-one all in analysis. So it will perform research same way as before, uh, but uh, it will additionally uh, generate bootstrap replicate alignments and um, infer bootstrap trees. And uh, uh, finally, it will compute uh, bootstrap support values and map those values on the branches of maximum likelihood tree. Uh, by default, it will also uh, use a conversion test to um, determine how many bootstrap replicates we actually need to uh, reliably estimate uh, support values. So here's a sample uh, uh, command line. Here we also use a couple of additional options uh, with a prefix option we can specify uh, the name of our output file so by default uh, it will be just a name of the uh, input MSA. it's not always uh, a best idea so we can uh, specify a different name manually and we also specify a uh, um, random number seed uh, it's a good idea if you want your run to be reproducible that if you just uh, run RaxML with the same command line again, it will give exactly the same result. Here's a sample output. Uh, so we see that uh, we in, uh, inferred uh, 20 uh, maxim, uh, maximum likelihood. We performed 23 searches and uh, we got our best score in three. And we also started bootstrapping with uh, up to 1000 replicates. Uh, but um, according to 
uh, our convergence criteria, it was actually enough uh, to have uh, 100 replicates. That's why we um, terminated uh, bootstrapping after 100 replicates. Right, and there are a lot of options uh, to uh, customize uh, your analysis. So you can use different number and different uh, kinds of uh, different sorts of starting trees or C-money based, completely random, also user uh, starting trees. You can um, explicitly specify the number of uh, bootstrap replicates which you want to use. Uh, you can uh, change the uh, branch lengths uh, linkage mode. You can specify minimum, maximum uh, branch lengths and so on. So uh, one uh, more uh, useful option is uh, uh, evaluation of tree likelihood on a fixed topology. So sometimes we uh, don't want to perform a full tree search, but we already have a topology and we just want to optimize uh, branch lengths and uh, free model parameters in topology. This topology. And uh, you can see in the logs that we start with uh, 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 low likelihood values and we perform branch lengths and model optimization. And this is our final likelihood, which is uh, better than the original one. And uh, three with the optimized branch lengths will be saved in the best three file. And uh, Raxmanji will also save uh, optimal, optimized model parameters in the best model file. So slight variation of this command is uh, uh, minus minus log likelihood. So this is uh, mostly useful for debugging. Uh, for debugging, if you don't want to uh, optimize anything, but you just want to uh, compute likelihood with fixed branch lengths and fixed uh, model parameters, and uh, this uh, co command will also it will not generate any output file. It will just give you uh, one number, which is a a log likelihood of this tree, given this branch lengths and given the parameters. Then uh, very quickly uh, check and parse, uh, especially for large data set or if you're starting to work on a new data set, it's usually a good idea to use a check command first. So this command will uh, prove, uh, uh, will um, check whether Raxmail uh, can uh, read your alignment file. And uh, oftentimes people have uh, something like um, invalid characters in uh, taxon names and some other formatting problems. And it's a good idea to identify those problems and fix them before starting a, a long tree search, which probably we will submit a cluster job, which will take like 12 hours to schedule. So it's, it's a good idea to know beforehand if there is any problem in your alignment. And uh, especially for large data set, you can use a parse uh, command, which uh, will um, also perform the check, but it will also generate a uh, <coughs> binary alignment file. And uh, you can then use uh, this binary alignment file in the actual uh, tree search. And especially if you are uh, using multiple nodes on a um, large alignment file, then uh, it will be much more efficient uh, to load it from the binary. Right, so uh, here I come to the parallelization. And uh, this is also uh, new in uh, version 1.0. So if you run uh, RaxMLNG without any um, additional option to uh, configure your uh, parallelization setups and uh, RaxMLNG will uh, use a heuristic to um, determine the uh, optimal setup for your data set. So uh, it will um, uh, check how many cores you have, how much memory you have, and uh, uh, then it will also check uh, the um, parameters of your analysis. And uh, all this information is used to um, automatically uh, configure parallelization setup. So um, what is important here is 
uh, whether we have multiple starting trees. Of course, if you have uh, just one starting tree that we cannot use um, cause grain parallelization, but in this case we have 20, so we can. Uh, then we also uh, check how many um, alignment patterns uh, we have because this is important for um, scalability of fine grain parallelization. In this case, we have very few patterns, and um, that's why we uh, cannot use uh, many cores with fine grain parallelization. And uh, therefore, in this case, the uh, automatic configuration uh, will uh, decide to use uh, 16 workers, workers uh, meaning 16 parallel tree searches, and uh, each of those will be running with one thread. And uh, each uh, worker will then get two uh, tree searches. And this is now the default, this uh, automatic uh, polarization, but of course you can uh, specify polarization setup manually. So it could be a fully manual where you say, okay, I want to use 16 threads and uh, two workers, two parallel tree searches, or you can say, uh, I want to use uh, up to 16 threads, but RaxMLG can decide how many based on the, on the same heuristic that I introduced before. And uh, the whole thing also work with MPI. So in this example, we have uh, four MPI uh, ranks, uh, each with uh, 16 threads each, which gives us uh, 64 threads in total. And those threads will be um, divided uh, across eight workers, uh, eight parallel tree searches, and each of them will be running with eight threads. Okay, now the uh, last point for today is uh, um, energy monitoring. And it's also a new features in Raxim NG uh, 1.0. Uh, I guess I don't have to explain why we should keep an eye on energy consumption. And it was actually uh, always, ob uh, always obvious that um, uh, large Raxim runs consume a lot of energy, but uh, at some point I was um, uh, curious how much exactly, or at least how much approximately. And um, it was not easy to um, obtain this information uh, from our cluster. So I decided, okay, I will try to implement it in Raxamil and Raxamil NG. And uh, uh, this will become available to all Raxamil NG users, whether they want to have it or not. Uh, so I will spare you the details, but uh, it actually turned out to be uh, much more difficult to implement than I expected. But the good news is that um, you know, pretty much um, uh, every modern uh, Intel CPU has hardware to measure power consumption. Uh, and uh, by modern, I mean last 10 years. So it's really pretty much uh, every system nowadays. Uh, bad news that uh, it only measures uh, power consumption for CPU and memory. So it's uh, usually an underestimate. And uh, also on the software level, you can get this information uh, uh, without a root privilege only on Linux system. But that's, that's usually fine. So uh, <coughs> this information will be displayed in the end of um, Raxmail uh, ng execution log. So you will uh, get a line like this. And this is actually for one of the large empirical uh, analysis uh, I'm running these days. And um, now I'm not sure whether I'm happy with these features. Uh, this feature uh, because uh, it tells me that just on one uh, uh, just on one uh, tree search I spent more energy than uh, I'm uh, burning in my flat uh, during one month but yeah, at least you can disable it or you can ignore it but uh, now uh, uh, seriously speaking so uh, I think it's important to have this measurement because as uh, old wisdom is saying, you cannot improve anything if you don't measure it. And uh, one interesting um, finding was that um, uh, if you are using a different number of uh, cores, a different number of threads on a single node, then the power consumption changes uh, quite significantly. 
So uh, you can see it on this uh, plot on the right that if you go from one thread to 16 threads, that uh, power consumption uh, grows, uh, uh, increases uh, more than twofold. So this is kind of uh, logical, but uh, it um, was uh, not that uh, obvious for me. And uh, then on the other hand, if we uh, use a fine grain polarization, then um, we, we cannot use uh, uh, too many uh, cores efficiently. So we have uh, runtime improvements initially as we add more and more core, but at some point it uh, 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 flattens out. And uh, actually, if you use too many cores and uh, runtime uh, starts to increase again. And uh, this means that in terms of uh, overall energy consumption, there is a, a sweet spot uh, somewhere here in the middle where uh, energy consumption is um, optimal and runtime is also either optimal or not, not much worse. And uh, this, this is also influenced uh, uh, design decision in uh, Raxam LNG. So previously on a single node, I was, uh, uh, again, by default, Raxam LNG was uh, always uh, using the maximum available number of cores. So in this case, it's 16. Uh, but as you can see in this example, it's actually not optimal in terms of runtime, uh, even although in runtime, the difference is negligible, but there is a huge uh, difference in en energy consumption. Uh, and uh, now uh, Raxam Energy will use uh, not the maximum number of cores, but the number of cores which uh, would be reasonable on this particular data set for this particular analysis. So in this example, it would be eight cores, which is uh, kind of almost optimal. So of course, it's, it will not be as good on every data set, but um, uh, I will work on improving this heuristic in a future version. So I'm afraid I'm already well over time. So I just have a couple of slides uh, with um, uh, information sources. So because it's, uh, uh, I don't have to explain much. So yeah, we have uh, web services. Mm. One is maintained by Vital IT. And this one's, one is completely free. So you just uh, open this web page and uh, you can uh, submit your uh, data set for analysis without uh, uh, any um, registration. And there is also a Cypress web server. You have to register there and they will give you something like 30,000 or 50,000 of free CPU hours. And then it's a better option for large data set. And uh, you can uh, download uh, precompiled binary from uh, GitHub. There's also a Conda installation, and there is also a graphical user interface, which is uh, developed by uh, Antonelli Lab. I guess in, in the most recent version, they also support Raxamology. Yeah, so on GitHub, we have documentation, we have tutorial, and there is a, a Google group where you can ask questions. Yeah, so thanks for your attention and sorry for uh, going a bit over time. And now uh, <coughs> please uh, ask the questions. Thank you very much, Alexis. Thank you very much, Alexei, for talking to us about the next generation of RaxML. This is software that's really had a huge impact on evolutionary science over the last 10 years. Um, before we take questions, I want to remind everybody this is an uh, ISMB Academy webinar that's sponsored jointly by the Evolutionary uh, Biology and Comparative Genomics COSI and SSMB. And we're running this as a journal club. If you would like to suggest future articles that would be good um, topics for webinars, you can send them to an email address, which I will put in the chat. So I'm going to read the questions to you from the question and, and have you answer them live. 
The first one is from Brian Kolachkovich, who wants to know about support for coarse grain parallelism and are there plans for GPU support plan? And he asked this question before you got to your parallelism section, so you may want to just recap given what you've already said. Right, so uh, uh, as I said, coarse grain parallelization is now available in uh, Raxim LNG uh, starting this version uh, 1.0 and uh, moreover, it will be used by default. So even if you don't specify it explicitly uh, for um, uh, data sets which would benefit from coarse grain parallelization, Raxim LNG will use it by default. And the second part of the question is about uh, GPU. So I um, haven't touched uh, upon this. Uh, so uh, previously, we previously made some attempts with the old RaxML uh, to port it on GPU. So it turns out that uh, RaxML uh, search algorithm is not the uh, best, um, uh, uh, <clears throat> not, uh, not the easiest algorithm to port on GPU. Uh, so we, uh, we could uh, try it again in the future. Uh, because uh, now even in our institute we have a huge uh, GPU cluster and we would like to uh, make use of it um, ourselves. Uh, uh, but it, it's a lot of work, so if, if you get a, a maybe a PhD student who is into GPUs, then yeah, we, we can talk. About it. So we have a question from Mario Stanke who says, could you please comment on the rate matrix Q? and how that's estimated both for GTRs and for larger alphabets. And in particular, he'd like to know, is the gradient computed with dif a numerical differentiation varying one element of Q at a time? Uh, I don't know, Alexis, do you want to take this one? Or? Yeah, well, we're, yeah, yeah, I can. Um, I don't know if we could turn my camera back on. I'm not sure, maybe the connection is more stable. Um, well, the right matrix for Q in all drags ML, well, we were essentially doing some sort of gradient, so just varying uh, one rate at a time and, and then uh, reevaluating uh, the likelihood score and so on and so forth. Um, as far as I remember, because it has been a very long time since I implemented that, um, I think we used a version of uh, Brandt's algorithm for that. Um, so there was no real, essentially no real numerical differentiation um, in the in the Q matrix estimation, but rather like just standard uh, search for for the optimal rates. Yeah. So uh, in uh, I guess it used to be brand in old RaxML in new RaxML and G is uh, BFGS, but uh, it's still. Uh, um, yeah, I'm not sure about the details, uh, whether it uses gradients or not. But it's definitely... Uh, yeah. so, as far as I remember, go ahead. As far as I remember, you use some sort of approximation of the gradient. Um, yeah, I, but, I guess that's the case. But, but not real, like it doesn't really do uh, differentiation. So. We're not um, we're not really computing any any um, differentials of the of the Q matrix. Any derivatives of the Q matrix? Sorry. So I'm going to. We have two questions, and I'm going to take them in the opposite order because one of them follows up on the question you've just been answering, which is: Does the use of the GTR model systematically bias tree inference? because the stationarity assumption is violated due to GC content. Sorry, where was, where was this question? I'm sorry, this is the question, it's in the Q&A. It's from um, uh, Prabhav, and I'm sorry, I'm gonna butcher your last name, so I will skip it. Um, does the use of the GTR model systematically bias tree inference because of the stationarity assumption is violated if, for example, you have differences in GC content? Um, yeah, well, yes, you, you, I think this, this is a claim one could generally make that, uh, of course, the search and the tree inference is biased if, if the uh, models we're using, uh, do not correspond to, to the real biological processes that are, that are taking place, right? So we could, 
uh, we could think about modeling processes uh, such as heterotachy, for instance, or using some, some additional mixture models to, um, to capture that. Um, so it's, I think there, there's always a trade of like how, what kind of specialized one models we want to develop or not just because of the huge implementation overhead or at least the extreme overhead to make this run efficiently. Um, but I think basically this is a claim that we can always make that the, um, that our model does not really correspond to the real, real biological processes. So um, in the end of the day, you know, you could use model testing to, to figure out what's going on, but typically also the, 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 the two model testing tools that are available now and are pretty fast also do not, not cover all models. So it's, yeah, I think it's, it's a very difficult question to, to answer. Yes, and I think it's a problem that all software or most tree software available today grapples with. It's larger than any particular implementation. We have a question from Pavia Battistuzzi who says, can the heuristic-based parallelization be used when submitting a job to HPCC using something like Slurm? And if 10 cores are requested in the Slurm job file, would this number of, or the heuristic number be used? And for those of us who don't know what Slurm is, perhaps you would start by introducing what that is and then answer the question. Uh, right. So uh, Slurm is a, a job manager, uh, which is uh, now getting more and more popularity and used on many um, HPC systems, uh, high performance computing systems. Uh, and uh, one of the uh, <clears throat> uh, features of Slurm that uh, you can specify um, uh, how, how many cores you want to use. So it could be, you could uh, specify that you want to use a, a full node or multiple nodes for a job, but then you can also say, okay, uh, uh, let's say you have nodes with um, uh, 20 cores each, uh, but you can say for my particular job, I want to um, allocate 10 cores out of those 20. And I guess that's what um, uh, is referred to in this question. And uh, yes, you can use heuristic based parallelization in this case as uh, the only thing that uh, you would uh, need to specify the number of cores that you allocated in the minus minus threads option because uh, uh, Energy, uh will not know how many um, uh, cores uh, your job got uh, um, uh, allocated. So it would, uh, the heuristic will just use the full number of cores available on this node. So uh, that's why uh, you should just uh, specify minus minus threads uh, auto and then uh, 10 in curly brackets and then the heuristic will use uh, up to uh, 10 nodes. So if uh, your data set is uh, too small that it could probably use just four nodes, uh, four cores out of 10. Uh, and uh, it was this number. Yeah, and then of course you, you could also use uh, 10 uh, cores if you specify it explicitly via minus minus threads 10. So we have a, a follow-up question from Prabhav, who wants to know what the log likelihood threshold is that you use for deciding when to stop the tree search. Uh, so it's uh, <clears throat> 0 0.1 by default, but uh, you, you can also uh, change it with minus minus uh, log likelihood option, I guess. So th there's definitely an option to, to, to change this threshold if you want. But, yeah. Um, so Marinaz Afkami would like to know whether RaxML will use TPU at some point in the future. I'm sorry, what is TPU? I, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so perhaps, the, hmm? I think it's the center processing unit, if I remember correctly, um, I think this was developed somehow by Google or in, in collaboration with uh, Google that would probably fits the um, the type of computations we're conducting relatively relatively well so you have to to formulate uh, as far as I remember because we briefly looked into it you have to formulate all mathematical operations as tensor operations and then then it runs pretty easily I um, we looked at it quickly at some point um, 
but I don't remember why we, <laughs> quite honestly, don't remember why we stopped looking, looking into it. I think uh, because it was not so easy to, to obtain access to those systems or we couldn't obtain access to, to them. So there was something like that, but this would um, initially be some sort of exploratory work where one would maybe just port like a very small subset of the functions we need for the full program to see how, how fast it would uh, execute on a TPU um, before deciding whether we want to port like the whole uh, breadth of models that, that is available to such a system. So that's always the trade-off, right? With TPUs, with GPUs, um, or if you're just going to use uh, standard x86 CPUs, what's the additional effort for what kind of gain of uh, performance? So I have a question, which is, could you tell us a little bit about the uh, transfer bootstrapping function, the uh, heuristic bootstrapping function that you've implemented in RaxML and G? Uh, right. Uh, so the, uh, it was uh, a nature paper from uh, Raymond Group. And the uh, uh, idea <coughs> behind this um, uh, transfer bootstrapping is uh, that on large data sets is uh, on, on rather uh, I should say on large trees with thousands of taxa uh, standard uh, Feldenstein bootstrap uh, would uh, usually yield a very low numbers for uh, deep branches and this is because uh, when uh, <coughs> Feldenstein bootstrap uh, support value is computed then we are looking for exact matches between um, branches of um, a reference tree, a maximal output tree, and branches of uh, bootstrap replicate trees. And as you can imagine, if you have thousands of taxa, thousands of um, uh, uh, leaves in the tree, then it's uh, not very, uh, it's becoming less and less likely Then you will observe these uh, exact matches. So it could be due to rock taxa, or it could be in general lack of signal in, in the short alignment and so on. And uh, that's why in transfer bootstrap, they uh, try to um, alleviate this problem by uh, introducing sort of distance function. So it's not uh, a binary decision anymore, whether, whether we count this uh, branch as a uh, match or not, but uh, we compute a distance between um, a branch in a reference tree and the closest branch in a bootstrap tree. And this, this is uh, normalized, so it's uh, between zero and one. So for each, each uh, bootstrap tree, we'll give a uh, uh, support value between zero and one for, uh, for a specific branch. And then in the paper, they, they show that it, uh, of course, it has a slightly higher um, uh, false uh, positive rates uh, than a, a traditional Feinstein bootstrap, but uh, only slightly, but then it could, um, uh, recover uh, support for uh, um, uh, more uh, deep branches and uh, function bootstraps. Uh, 